Hi folks, this is Abel James, and thank you so much for listening to the Fat Burning Man Show, where we talk about real food and real results. We're here this week with wilderness survival expert, Cliff Hodges. I think you guys will really dig this show. We talk about a lot of things I really haven't covered in other shows about how to get by in the backcountry, how it resets your body, how to fuel, all sorts of different things. Now, along those lines, one thing we've started to do with the blog recently is uh, instead of just doing transcripts, we have uh, blog posts and articles that hit the main takeaways in kind of a quick read format if you don't have time to listen to the whole show uh, on the blog. So if you'd like access to that totally for free, go to fatburningman.com and check it out. I have more than 150 shows with people like uh, Tim Ferriss, Dave Asprey, Michelle Tam from Nom Nom Paleo, Steve Cam is coming up soon, all sorts of fun. So if you'd like to check out the entire archive, it's always available to you at fatburningman.com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter at fatburnman and Facebook as Fat Burning Man or Abel James. I love hearing what you guys think of shows, so drop me a line. In the meantime, here's the review of the week. Awesome podcast, five stars. This one's from David. I never write reviews, but I feel compelled to for Fat Burning Man. I've lost 60 pounds in the past four and a half months following a low-carb, high-protein diet. I've done that before, but always gained it back. I've learned so much in the past couple of months from Abel. It's incredible. These tools will help me from gaining back the weight now that I truly understand what certain foods do to my body. The biohacking and supplement information is so great, and I'm starting to incorporate many of them into my life. Thank you for making such an awesome show, Abel. I only wish you did daily episodes. I can't get enough. (laughs) Well, David, I really appreciate that. Actually, this is a good opportunity to bring it up. Um, If you guys have ideas about who else I can interview for this show, please leave a comment on Facebook letting me know that I should interview X person. Or if you're signed up for my email list, just drop a quick line uh, you know, in the subject field, say, you should have this person on your podcast and then kind of send me a link to it because I'm always looking for more people to have uh, shows with and, and interview to bring the best value to you guys. But after doing over 150 of them, sometimes it's a challenge to find brand spanking new people who have never been on the show before since I've really made the round. So if you have an idea of someone who would be awesome for the podcast, please Uh, Sign up for my email list, reply to the email, and just uh, say who you think would be awesome. And I'll do my very best to get them on the show because I would love to do it every day. In some ways, I would just run out of people super quickly. So get those ideas coming and uh, let's, let's talk about the show all about survival with Mr. Cliff Hodges. On this show, you'll learn what to pack in your survival kit if you're going out into the woods or going on a hike or going out kayaking, whatever, a minimalist kit, what should be in there how and what to eat when you're stuck in the woods, and also, how do we prepare for the zombie apocalypse? All right, let's go talk with Cliff. Hi guys, it's Abel, and I'm very excited to be here this week with my friend Cliff. Cliff Hodges is an accomplished entrepreneur and outdoor guide, traveling the world to climb mountains, surf big waves, study with indigenous tribes, and lead groups of clients, ranging from school groups to corporate executives to tap into their true potential, through wilderness adventures. He's also a smarty pants with bachelor's and master's from MIT and has been featured on National Geographic and MTV. A few weeks ago, Cliff even (laughs) taught me how to build a fire the old-fashioned caveman way when we were out in the woods. Cliff, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. Abel, it's so great to be here, man. Thanks for having me. I'm stoked. So let's let's start with a really important question uh, that I get a lot from my my listeners and, and readers and all of that. How do we prepare for the zombie apocalypse? <laughs> How do we prepare for the zombie apocalypse? Well, first you call me. <laughs> um, how do we prepare for the zombie apocalypse? Hopefully we, we prevent the zombie apocalypse by, <laughs> by getting back to nature. But yeah. really, I, I mean, what I think is, uh, is you get back in touch with some original human skills. You know, we, we're, we're animals on this planet like anyone else, and yet we're super scared of going out in the wilderness and getting away from our urban centers and and being an animal on this planet. And yeah. I know the zombies are going to stay in the cities. So get, <laughs> Obviously. get your, get your woodsman skills <laughs> up to par, um, get your survival skills up to par with me and you'll be fine. Cool. So one of the things that I thought was awesome that you started, uh, the class that I took with you a few weeks ago, um, you started with this, which is basically getting people to put dirt all over their faces on their bodies and, <laughs> and get, uh, get into it. So why did you do that? And, and what does that do to people? 
you know, it makes my life a lot easier as yeah. a teacher. <laughs> and um, but you know, really, the reason why I do it is, I think it just gets people in the right headspace and makes their experience of being out in the wilderness that much better. So to kind of explain a little more detail, before I started that class with you, like with all my classes, I have people pick up pine needles and crush them in their hands and rub dirt on their face and leaves on their face. And it's because, look, we're going to be out there learning survival skills. You're going to get dirty. You're going to be building shelters, starting fire. You're going to end the day with dirt under your fingernails and your hair smelling like campfire. Hmm. And you can either enjoy it and love it and immerse yourself in it and really learn, or you can be kind of tiptoeing around and, uh, and really not delving into it, not experience it at all. And then you're just making it miserable for yourself. Yeah. There's a really interesting shift, uh, that I think we used to be making all the time between you imagine like a cowboy or something like that. Um, a few generations ago where they were kind of living in nature, fighting the elements, you know, even something like shoveling snow growing up in New Hampshire definitely gives you that like shock value of in between comfort and being out there. But I think most people and, and myself included, it's like if you just took a shower and like you're wearing nice clothes or whatever uh, and you go out and take a wilderness class, I think without knowing it, most of us are kind of coming in with that mentality, right? Um, because we're so trained uh, to be germaphobes and you need shirts need to be cleaned and ironed and whatever. Um, yeah. Can you offer like a counterpoint to that in terms of like how how much happier it makes you when you break out of that every once in a while? Yeah, well, I mean, before even that, just leading into that, I think, you know, a lot of this is just it's very generational. It's just in the last generation or two, you know, it used to be that kids would get home from school or on the weekends and mom and dad would kick the kids outside. Right. And and now outside is scary and it's dirty. And we've taught our kids that it's something to avoid because it's dangerous and you might get sick. And uh, so we've really, you know, insulated an entire generation or multiple generations now from experiencing the outdoors. And I think it's just such a huge part of being a human being. Mm -hmm. And what I find is when I get people out there, there, there maybe usually is a little bit of that sort of adjustment period. But when I can get people to let go of that, everything from de-stressing to reconnecting, re-energizing, I think it's it's just a crucial part of being a human being that a lot of people are lacking in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, totally. I, I remember, so when I was uh, at Dartmouth, I was with the Dartmouth Outdoors Club leading like outdoor trips. And a lot of them were for uh, incoming freshmen that basically had, <laughs> some of them had, had never, <laughs> let alone like be in the woods, they'd never pooped in the woods. And that was yeah. <laughs> like a big <laughs> obstacle to overcome. But it was like, you know, pretty much week long trips. And something really cool happened at the beginning. You know, a lot of people are like afraid of everything. And, you know, someone gets a tick or, you know, someone gets a scratch and everyone freaks out. And then over the course of a few days, you know, there's a little bit more levity and you start, you know, singing in the woods, you know, just like you don't care yeah. at all. No one has showered in three or four days. You're all sweaty. You're all stinky. <laughs> you're all kind of enjoying it. But um, somewhere in between there, your body and your mindset kind of like shifts into, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My body knows how to do this, too. Right. Like you don't you don't shower for a while and your hair all of a sudden like starts looking and feeling better, even yeah. though it's dirtier than ever. And, and you just kind of, it, it recalibrates your whole idea of what happiness is, what fear is, what fun is. And by the end of those trips, like those, all those kids and it, like everyone was glowing. Some people were definitely really happy to be back. But when you come back, it's like seeing a toilet or running water and just splashing that on your face. <laughs> It's yeah, like yeah. you appreciate everything you so appreciate much more. It. So, so talk yeah. about that when, because you've taken some pretty, especially for your, your shows, we talked a little bit about this a few weeks ago. You've taken some people who are pretty much newbies to nature out in the forest. What happens? Yeah. Well, I think, so I think there's two things. I think you get both an internal and an external shift as long as you spend enough time out there. And internally, I think what happens more than anything is this, reprioritization and people really start to look at um it's a term i use a lot i say needs versus wants yeah and in our daily lives in urban modern world we seem to label a lot of things as needs that when you're out there in the woods all of a sudden you don't need your cell phone you don't need high-end um hair conditioner you don't need all these <laughs> 
all these different things, they all of a sudden they become luxury items and wants and, and you break it down and it really, I think, helps people just get back to basics. They need, what do they need? They need to eat every day. They need to drink water. They need shelter. They need a warm place to go to sleep. Um, and that's, that's about it. So you get this huge internal shift of prioritization. Um, and also externally, you know, you mentioned leading groups of students. And I think one of the coolest things these kinds of experiences can have for groups is that that external shift is that everyone's kind of stripped down and mm -hmm. equalized. Mm -hmm. And when you're in the middle of nowhere and you're sleeping in a shelter and cooking your food over a campfire, it doesn't matter whether you're a CEO or an unemployed, you know, college student or teenager even, you're both out there and you both need to find food. Mm -hmm. You both need to cook it. You both need to build a shelter. And so both internally and externally, I think you get a big sort of reprioritization and equalization for everybody. Yeah. So let's do this. What if you uh, just drop someone out of a plane, you know, hopefully with a parachute or whatever, into the woods who doesn't really have experience? You've actually done this for people, right? And walked them through. Yeah. Um, what does that look like? Like what, what do you have them do first? What are the priorities that are immediate? If, you know, if, if someone like a literal survival situation, someone is in a car wreck and it like tumbles down, but they get out of their car and they can't reach civilization, something like that. What, what do you do? Yeah. So I always teach people the basic four necessities of survival and it's shelter, water, fire, and food. And we always say it in that order. Every class I'm teaching, I say it over and over and over again to beat it into people's brains. Shelter, water, fire, food. Um, and I say it in that order because in almost all, at least most survival situations, that's kind of your order of necessity. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we can, the human body is so susceptible to exposure. We can die of exposure without shelter in a matter of hours. We can go a couple days without water. We can go weeks without food. So I teach them that order and we immediately dive into shelter and talk about what what are we facing out here? Is it hot or is it cold? Is it wet? And what do I need to do to insulate my body from the exterior environment? Yeah, one of the things that I was so surprised by uh, the first time I took some like wilderness survival classes was the emphasis on almost excluding everything else and just talking about the elements and how important it is to make sure that you have that under control as the first thing because you can actually... You can die and get hypothermia at way higher temperatures than most people would realize, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because I sometimes I get people out for these classes and they're like, I want to make a spear and kill an animal. <laughs> and it's like, like, OK, that's great. But that is like the last thing you need to be doing right now. <laughs> like you're going to waste a ton of energy and you're going to die of exposure before you ever eat it. Um, so, yeah, as far as our, our susceptibility to exposure you know, people, when I say dying of exposure, I think people conjure up this image of being stuck on the top of a mountain in the Himalayas covered in snow and right. freezing to death. But people don't realize you can die of exposure in like 58 degree, like almost approaching 60 degree weather. If you're wet, say you've had a stream crossing and the wind picks up and then you're sedentary for a few hours, your core temperature can drop really, really quickly. And once you kind of head down that path, it's a really slippery slope because mm -hmm. the first thing that happens is kind of a mental fog when you start reaching those initial stages of hypothermia, like mental fog, poor decision making, loss of kind of body control a little bit. And it's very, very hard to recover from. So you don't need to be in the middle of the snow to die of exposure. You can have exposure on a sunny but windy day if you get a little wet. Yeah. Or especially if you don't plan ahead. That's another big way to, to kind of like make sure that you don't get into a dicey yeah. situation where, you know, a lot of people, especially when they first get into this lifestyle, it's like, oh, I'm just going to go out in the woods and you take a little water bottle and maybe a, you know, windbreaker or something like that. And if, if you get stuck out there, um, it gets pretty serious pretty fast, right? A storm comes in or, you know, you take a wrong turn, you don't know your way back. Um, what, what do you do in that situation? Uh, say you're you're in the woods it's a nice summer day walk me through like the next steps there you freak out you realize you have to get through the night right you realize you have to get through the night and i think you know in most situations in north america at least you know we're not i'm right now i'm not really going to approach like 
desert island tropical survival where it's 90 <laughs> degrees all the right. time. But Just drinking pina in, coladas and hanging out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in, in most situations in the northern hemisphere, you know, you're dealing with, especially overnight, you're dealing with cold survival. So you're mm-hmm. dealing with the situation of staying warm and staying dry. And so that's what I tell people, look, you got to stay warm, you got to stay dry. Our, our bodies are really good at thermoregulation of themselves, which means we, you know, as long as we're properly fueled, we're drinking water, we're at least getting some food, our bodies maintain our temperature. Um, and we're so used to being indoors that we think our bodies just do that magically. But yeah. All of a sudden, when you're outdoors and you're exposed to the environment, your body can't do that unless you get it inside some sort of enclosed space where it can at least heat a tiny sort of microfilm of air around itself. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, stay warm, stay dry. That means maybe if you got to get something quick, getting under a fallen log or into a cave. And if you have enough time to build a shelter, it's like doing what I did with you a few weeks back building a debris shelter. It's building a structure that you can pile just tons and tons of leaves, pine needles, dirt, sticks on top of, and you're creating a space to put your body inside of so that it's not facing that ambient environment. Yeah. What about, a lot of people are afraid of creepy crawlies and, you know, I'm from New Hampshire and so everyone's just like, are there bears? There are bears there. I don't know if I can go outside. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about, um, I, I would say this is a total leading question, obviously, but, um, how those fears are are overstated. <laughs> yeah, you know what's funny too is is generally I don't even get the question of bears. I get more of like bug bites. Right. And I and I and I have to tell people, look, I'd rather have a thousand bug bites than freeze to death. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah, it's not sleeping overnight in a debris shelter is you're probably gonna get some bug bites and you might not sleep great your first time doing it. But there's a huge difference between being uncomfortable and being dead. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> <Right. laughs> to be to be really blunt about it. But then, yeah, after that, you do kind of get into some of those larger fears people talk about. Probably the two most common be like mountain lions or bears. Mm -hmm. And what you have to remember is, except in the rare situation, we're at the top of the food chain, and most of those animals don't want to have anything to do with human beings. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, probably the one animal in North America that I don't really want to run run into would be a grizzly bear. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) especially late in the summer, early fall when food's getting scarce. So I'd kind of be careful in that environment. But, you know, just about anything else, if you're minding your own business and you're careful, there's not a lot out there that's looking to attack human beings. Yeah. What about the fear base? There are a lot of questions, especially recently with all the media coverage of, uh, you know, getting flus from birds or bug bites being infecting you with (laughs) with all sorts of scary things. Um, I... (laughs) Does that happen? I am way more <laughs> I am way more afraid of touching the little credit card machine at Walmart <laughs> than, than I am of g- getting sick out in the wilderness. Like by far people are so much more disgusting than yeah. wilt than nature. Right. So, you know, I uh other than waterborne stuff, like knowing how to purify your water to right. protect yourself from things like giardia, um, I'm never really afraid of of eating wild edible plants or or hunting and trapping in the wild so yeah Yeah. i think we have way more germs in society than we do out there (laughs) in the wilderness yeah gnarly ones in society especially but (laughs) that's a good point about the water i remember when i was uh i think this was my first trip it was like the second day or something like that we happened upon a stream that looked like it had pretty clean water that was flowing you know at a pretty good clip and uh we had our nalgenes with uh our our pills to make the water drinkable and (laughs) The guy next to me dunks his Nalgene in there and comes up with it. And it's got this like, I think it was dragonfly larva or something like that. Like uh, the size of a huge cockroach just kind of like scrambling up the side of his Nalgene. <laughs> he, yeah. I think for the next four years, he had the name Captain Cockroach. I think that, I think it kind of stuck <laughs> with him. Um, but yeah. it's it's less... That's less scary than um, some of the stuff that might be lurking in the water that could actually get you really sick and dehydrated. Um, what, what do you do about that? How do you prepare? How do you find clean water? Sure. So what I tell people, first of all, is the things that you can see aren't the things that hurt you. So mm-hmm. you're talking about the, you know, the insect larvae or just dirt or leaves or whatever. That, anything that's big enough to see generally isn't going to hurt you barring the rare and occasional poisonous plant or something like that. It's mm-hmm. the stuff you can't see. It's the invisible stuff. It's the small bacteria and viruses that are that can be 
in the water that is what you have to watch out for because they make you sick. You have things like diarrhea and vomiting, and people die generally from those type of illnesses. Oregon Trail, of, right? Of, Everyone dies from yeah, dysentery. Yeah, dehydration, <laughs> dysentery, exactly. Um, and so what you need to know how to do is purify your water. Uh, except for a few rare locations, it's the best thing you can do is assume any water you get out in the wild in North America is contaminated. Mm -hmm. I wish it weren't that way, <laughs> yeah. but it is. You know, if you can find like a spring at its source, water coming straight from groundwater, you can probably be all right. Um, or very, very high elevations where you're not getting any mammals um, using the water source as a restroom. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I assume it's contaminated and I treat it. And with treatment, you have a lot of different options. If you are backpacking and you have your gear, uh, you have a lot of modern options such as water purification tablets, mm -hmm. like you said, or filtration pumps. Um, they even have UV, sort of these little, like they look like miniature lightsabers yeah. that you stick in the those. water to purify. Um, tastes better or you than take iodine. it back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It tastes much better than iodine. <laughs> or if you have absolutely none of that stuff, you take it back to the basics and uh, you get your primitive survival skills on point and you boil your water. And in order to do that, you have to have several skills under your belt. You have to be able to start a fire, whether that be with modern equipment or fire by friction mm -hmm. as i taught you yeah and you have to be able to create some sort of natural collection vessel and then usually what we do in, in a survival situation is to heat hot rocks in a fire and move those hot rocks from the fire into some sort of water vessel to flash boil it yeah. once the hot rocks hit the water old school <laughs> old school yeah it i admit having a pump like a like a filter pump yeah takes you know is a lot easier it takes a couple minutes but it's good to have all those skills under your belt because if you're out there with nothing and you find yourself there for multiple days water is going to be an issue mm -hmm. and uh, and you want to be able to purify it so if you're biking or hiking running whatever you're going out in the woods you know that there is some risk but you don't have much space to have like your whole backpack of gear what would you put in in a little pack Sure. Uh, like the most minimalistic stuff I would bring would definitely be an excellent knife. A knife is such an important tool mm -hmm. for everything from shelter building to fire creation. Um, so I'd have a knife. I'd have a little bit of cord, some paracord that can be also be used for fire making kits or shelter construction. Um, and then for a real small kit, I'd probably have a little, little bottle of tablets, mm -hmm. little purification tablets, because while the pumps can work a little better and you can always do it without it. The tablets take up the least amount of space. You know, yeah. they're about the size of a half a roll of quarters. And the only reason why I choose tablets over something like the UV purifier is that tablets don't break and they don't lose charge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where it is a, a UV purifier, the batteries can go dead, they're electronics, they can break. And I always like bringing things that are fail proof. Yeah. What about this on the other side of, so you've taken the newbies out in the woods but have you seen or learned from anyone who's done something spectacular or amazing, maybe some of the indigenous people who you've studied with being able to s survive something incredible or, or creating something like a great shelter or something like that? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's uh, I'm still beyond kind of all the different skills, though the skills that I find to be the most impressive mm -hmm. and difficult are the hunting skills, the yeah. primitive hunting skills. So being able to fabricate stone tools and uh, let you know, make native style bows and arrows, all handmade wooden self bows and stone tools is still some of the absolute most difficult and most advanced survival mm -hmm. and indigenous skills I've ever experienced. Yeah. And and um, you know the the absolute just expertise you find with people that use these kind of things on a daily basis. I mean, you know, I've seen native people in the Amazon use slings to throw little rocks the size, you know, half the size of golf balls over 50 yards and take <laughs> birds or monkeys out wow. of a tree. And, and, you know, I'd say in the average person in North America, I could take a deer, tranquilize it, tie it to a fence post and they couldn't <laughs> kill it, kill it, kill it with <laughs> primitive weaponry. So the, you know, the kind of mastery that you see with a lot of those different indigenous tribes and people who use primitive weaponry is just incredible compared to any sort of modern hunting equipment we have and i would think that after seeing something like that it just kind of like blows your mind of what is a human capable of 
how do you help people kind of like take that leap from, uh, oh, I got a bug bite to, you know, taking out an animal from 50 yards away? Yeah. So the, the thing I try to impress upon people the most is that these skills are a part of you. So, you know, here in, uh, I'm in North America, here in North America, we associate these skills with Native Americans, but it doesn't matter where you trace your lineage back to, whether you're ancestors came from Europe, Asia, Africa, North America, you are directly descendant from people who built earthen shelters, started fire by friction, hunted and gathered, created stone tools. And, you know, I refuse to accept that whether you believe in science or a creator or whatever that is, that we were the only animals on the planet that were, are too dumb and incapable of, of doing it. We've just, we've moved too far away from it. So before even teaching specific skills, I try to get people comfortable with the idea that this is part of their lineage, no matter mm -hmm. who they are and where they're from. And let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, an interesting phenomenon that, that I always experience when I'm out in nature. Uh, you start eating a lot differently. And one of the, one of the things that got me uh, into intermittent fasting as kind of a lifestyle when I'm even not out in the woods is that when you're hiking around all day or even if you're just out there, um, you definitely don't really feel this inclination to always eat three square meals a day or, or certainly eat every no. two hours or something like that. Can you talk a little bit, a bit about how you fuel when you're out there? Yeah, definitely my eating pattern is very different. One, I eat a lot less. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, one of the big rules and tenets of a survival situation is conservation of energy. And you're not running around doing all the crazy stuff we do in our daily lives. Yeah. So you don't, you don't need to eat your three square meals a day or your five partitioned out portions a day. I find myself eating a lot less and definitely intermittent fasting kind of by necessity right. because if I really was wanting to be eating that much, I'd pretty much be hunting and gathering <laughs> at, yeah. at all times. Right. And, and I would say there's a solid 72 hour adjustment period where it, it is a little miserable. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're used, used to eating on a very scheduled clock three times a day, um, people find themselves really a, unable to think of anything other than food and why they're not eating yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the time. Right. Um, but ap after that, the adjustment is, is almost instantaneous, I find. After a couple days, people are able to get by on less food, and it's often you know, one meal a day or maybe two meals a day and no, no meal the next day and then one or two meals that day. So the the intermittent fasting comes in really by the fact that you have no other choice because you can't be hunting and gathering all the time. Right. So doesn't that kind of, especially after people reach that adjustment point, doesn't it, for me, it breaks a lot of uh, paradigms and, and templates for the way that people lead their their day-to-day -day lives, right? Where they think that, oh my God, if I ate two meals a day, then I would wither away or th there's no way yeah. I could ever do that. Or if certainly if I ate one meal a day, I'd be dead. Or if I skipped meals altogether for a day and then ate the next day or something like that at the next camp, you know, would be an example out in the woods. People in their day to day kind of domesticated lives would never consider that that would be, you know, something that you would get sued for even bringing up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you yeah. Know? You know, I think it just provides an amazing feeling of freedom. I think yeah. so many people feel somewhat like sort of prisoners of their own body and in, in, in their life. And I think it just instills into people that much more just what our bodies are capable of. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very empowering. It's very empowering for people to know that they can do a whole heck of a lot more than um, sit at a desk from nine to five and eat three meals a day and wake up the next day to do the same thing. Yeah. And there's a really interesting thing that happens with uh, morale too, right? When you when you start eating, you bring food into the equation. And I, I still stand by this, that the best meal I've ever had was a dehydrated bean burrito when I was out yeah, in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an appreciation thing. It's kind yeah. of that goes back to that whole idea of needs and wants. And, and all of a sudden, every meal becomes special. And every meal becomes amazing and incredible. And, uh, you know, can you imagine what we'd be like if as a society everyone was walking around and taking 
every single meal is like a gift from God. And they were so excited to have it. I mean, or drink of water, right? Right. Or drink of water. And I think it just leads to this incredible feeling of, of satisfaction. And, um, you know, it brings a little more, more concept of ceremony into life. You can see why there's, especially in native cultures, there's so much ceremony is everything feels like such a gift. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a beautiful thing when you see that in action, especially when you travel around, but uh, for you, you weren't always, always like a wilderness instructor. Was there, how have you changed as a person by kind of incorporating these skills uh, or saving these skills, right? <laughs> Trying to protect yeah. them in a lot of ways. How, how has that informed your, your lifestyle and habits? I mean, it, God, it's, it's, it is my life. So yeah. um, it's hard to say, just give you a very succinct answer as to how has it changed my life. Um, it, it has given me a, a lot of purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't think I don't think at any point in my childhood that I think I was I'm going to grow up to be a wilderness survival instructor. <laughs> I don't think. I mean, it, I'm sure it would have sounded cool, but I don't think I ever thought of it. Wait, didn't and you so do I, it for like a summer job or something at first? I did, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and and really, I did it as a summer job because I didn't want to get a real job, right. quote unquote, <laughs> real job. And so I did it as a summer job when I was done with college, trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life. And people just kept signing up, yeah. And and slowly but surely, the business built. But you know, I'd say it's given me, it's definitely given me purpose. And another thing it's really done for me is giving me a lot of patience, hmm. um, because I think. And that really more comes from my students because I think when I first started it, I expected everyone to just do what I did. Yeah. And um, especially from a business perspective, that was terrible customer service. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it also made me realize just the varied and different backgrounds that people come from and not everyone was able to come from my background and mm-hmm. grow up spending time in the woods. And so it made me um, much more appreciated, appreciative of my experience and much more patient with people to really help and enjoy their journey along with them to be more comfortable in nature. Yeah. Now, how about this? Um, so we've been traveling for almost a year and we've done this a few times. You know, I just love road trips, love seeing, especially North America, because it's right there, right? <laughs> and, yeah. it's, and it's yeah. so easy to do. And I'm always shocked by how many people haven't seen incredible things like Bryce Canyon, Yellowstone, uh, the Carlsbad Caverns, and uh, even you know, more popular things like my folks live in St. Augustine now, which is like the oldest town in North America. Most Americans don't even know that, right? Like we haven't seen so much. So what, what are some of the things that you would tell people to go see that they haven't, you know, gone on that road trip to do in just a weekend or whatever, kind of like scatter it around wherever in North America? Yeah. You know, and so first of all, gosh, what an amazing park system we have. I don't think I think we take it for granted because most Americans haven't left the country and don't know that that's not something that exists everywhere right. in the world. And we have such incredible, I mean, I still think we can do more, but we have such incredible land protections and public land opportunities in this right. country and, and that a lot of people don't take advantage of. So, And that's what I recommend for people, especially if getting outside is new for you, is to start with the park system because it's the most sort of packaged and presentable thing. You know, we also have... BLM lands and national forests, but those are often a lot less regulated and there's Mm -hmm. less sort of services and amenities. So I tell people, if you're going to start getting outside, start with the national parks. My personal favorite would be sort of that northern, western half of the country corridor Mm -hmm. ranging from South Dakota through Montana, Idaho, Idaho, Wyoming, that area, just because I think it is some of the most sort of pristine and just vast wilderness I've, I've ever encountered in my life. Yeah. It, um, you know, you can still see Buffalo out there. Right. You can see wolves, you can see amazing wildlife and, and space that goes on for so far that you can't imagine it in. Yeah. And almost like the first thing that we do when we haul our RV into a new town is we look around for where's the closest wilderness. And even like, you'd be surprised where you can be in terms of um, being in a super urban place, but still be close to something that kind of puts you in that other, I'm in the woods mode. Um, what would you suggest to people who are, you know, still in, in urban mode to kick them out and, and go out for the weekend? What, what do they do? Are there good websites? You know, like national parks obviously are great, but 
What's yeah, the next but step? start with whatever is closest to you. Yeah. If, if you <laughs> have not, if you have not had that experience of camping or even just day hike, getting out into the wilderness, scrap my whole idea of a you know <laughs> national park tour and start with whatever's closest to you. Yeah. And you know, some areas do have great resources. Some areas have sort of parks coalitions. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on where you're from. You might be able to find it really easily. And at the very least, you can pull up Google Maps, go to your hometown, and look, look for, for the, the nearest green. green. <laughs> yeah. Look for the green That's spot. Yeah. Yeah. And then they're all, always labeled with maybe some sort of recreation area or county park or state park. Um, but I would absolutely start with whatever is closest to you. And then if you are not quite sure how to tackle it from a map, you'll at very least get the name. Mm -hmm. And whether it's a recreation area or a state park, you can Google that and there will be some sort of agency that manages it. Yeah. So there'll be, you know, a ranger station or a park office that will have everything from trail maps to a list of regulations, what you can and can't do. But just about any public land in this country is going to have a management agency that is going to tell you exactly how to get there, how to use it appropriately and, you know, what you can and can't do. Yeah. Green spots on the Google map. Green spots. Yeah. <laughs> it's so easy. Um, cool. So we're just about out of time, but before we go, why don't we talk about where people can find you and what you're working on next? Sure. Absolutely. So, uh, the name of my outdoor school is adventure out and you can find us at adventureout.com. Pretty easy to remember adventureout.com. And as far as you know what I'm working on. My company's been in business for 10 years. We have tons and tons of opportunities for people who are either beginners or advanced um, outdoor recreation users. And then the thing I'm really working on the most right now to take my company to the next level is guide training. So I run seminars where people who already have the outdoor experience and want to turn it into a profession can come and take our guide training seminar and mm. learn the whole business aspect of it. And hopefully go out and do what I've done somewhere else and, and start their own guiding and instructional business. I can say that leading those trips out in the woods for, for the newbies and even for some of the experienced people was one of like the best things I've done in my life. It's just such a it's, it's kind of like being a camp counselor or something like that. It, it is, you know, I mean, being an outdoor professional is. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to do anything different with my life. It's, yeah. it's an amazing experience and you kind of get to relive that first connection with nature over and over again as you get mm -hmm. to see your, your clients go through it. It's a beautiful thing. Well, Cliff, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. I know people will dig this. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Abel. Hey, this is Abel James from Fat Burning Man. And if you liked this video today, please take a quick second to subscribe to this YouTube channel. Now, I have a quick question for you. Do you want to learn how to get fit and lose fat by exercising less? Get the step-by-step -step strategies for how to do that right now for free. All you have to do is subscribe to this channel right now, then click the link below to fatburningman.com. Enter your best email to sign up for my newsletter, and I'll send you a quick start guide to burning fat right now and some ridiculously good recipes as a special thanks. Once again, just go to fatburningman.com right now and enter your best email to get your free fat-burning download straight to your inbox. I'll talk to you soon. But this keeps it nice There's and warm. Another product uh, and it's about the same price as those glass ones. So I broke enough and of those why so many to go for this one. It's lasted a long time. I, 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 I felt this. When I was my first video.